you something? Ah! I was born for this. It's Erie, Indiana, premiering Sunday, September 15th on NBC. Mr. Chu will demonstrate the difference between reading the Houston Post and the other paper. Mr. Chu? As you can see, the other paper's a bit hard to get through. But the Post, now here's a complete paper. It's easy to read with all the news you need, fast. And now when you buy a new Sunday subscription, get the rest of the week free. Call 1-800-776-POST. Use your credit card, and when you buy Sundays, get Monday through Saturday free. The Houston Post. Call now. Presenting Tulip. Mommy, can we paint a bright running star? Well, sure, honey. It's easy. With Tulip at your fingertips, there's nothing you can do. Tulip is the paint uniquely formulated for decorating fabric. Try the glitter. This is fun. Tulip Color Fast Paints. Available in leading craft, discount, and fabric stores. Look, Mommy, I'm a star. We all are. <laughs> There's nothing you can't do. Tulip Color Fast Paints. The hottest story of the summer. To kill a child, to help a child? Does that make sense? The cheerleader murder for hire trial. Television and tabloids reported on Wanda Holloway's every move. But Channel 2 News went one step further. An exclusive interview one-on-one -on -one with the woman many call the ultimate stage mother. Wherever it breaks, whatever it takes. Channel 2, Houston's 24-hour news channel. Watch us work for you. Ways to burglar-proof your home. Monday on Channel 2 News at 10. This program is brought to you by the Bob Lanier for Mayor campaign. In the Western Pacific, they're called typhoons. In the Indian Ocean, cyclones. And the Australians call them willy willies. But in this part of the world, our name for the most destructive of all weather phenomenon is hurricane. Often a hurricane that hits the Texas coast is born in Africa. It may start out as a rain shower or a small weather disturbance over the equatorial belt and then end up a swirling storm system covering thousands or even hundreds and thousands of square miles. We've been recording hurricanes and tropical storms since Columbus's second voyage to the New World. And you'd think in all that length of time we'd know everything there is to know about them. But they're still very, very mysterious. We do know in some ways they're connected with uh, disturbances out in the Sahara Desert over in Africa as they move out into the Atlantic. We know that a lot of disturbances move across the Atlantic. A few of them, and a very few, can become tropical depressions. That's when you have closed isobars or, or real circulation. Some of those, not very many, become tropical storms. They receive a name. That's when we are all alerted and become a bit more concerned about its course. And there's also a place out there called the envelope. And if one gets into that envelope, brings it into the Caribbean, then we know there's a fairly good chance that it could come into the Gulf of Mexico. Then we're really alerted by it. A few of those, and again, a very few, become hurricanes. And the hurricanes, of course, as we know, can be real killers. The deadliest natural disaster in the history of our country was the great Galveston hurricane of 1900. The winds registered 84 miles an hour, but that was just before the island's anemometer was blown away. We don't know how strong the winds eventually got. Tides 20 feet above normal swept over the entire island, damaging everything in its wake. 2,600 homes were completely swept away, and the death toll was, of course, staggering. Thomas Edison recorded the aftermath with one of his new motion picture cameras. After all these years since the big 1900 hurricane, the worst ever, a lot of people think that uh, there was no knowledge to evacuate, that nobody even tried to. There have been the stories about the horses and the cattle heading to the north end of all the ranges to the fences. They knew something was coming. Also, about 12,000 people evacuated Galveston before that storm hit. 
but the rest of the population was stranded when a steamship broke free of its moorings and crashed through three bridges leading to the mainland. Some of the people just didn't even know anything about it or didn't care and decided to stay, just as we do sometimes today. No one's really sure how many people died in that storm, but the estimates are between six and 8,000. And after cleaning up, the survivors knew they had to find a way to protect themselves and their homes in the future, should it ever happen again. So they built the seawall and they began a grade raising project that took seven years to complete. They actually built up the island, raising the land about eight feet. It was an incredible engineering feat. The great hurricane also changed history. It made people realize that we needed an inland port in this area and a ship channel to get to it. By 1914, the port of Houston was completed. That opened a new gateway to the world and provided a much safer harbor during raging storms like this one. There's one town in Texas that was completely swept away by a hurricane. Indianola, near Matagorda Bay, was hit by a hurricane back in 1875. That hurricane destroyed three-fourths of the town. Eleven years later, in 1886, another devastating hurricane struck, and this time the storm surge carried away or destroyed every house in town. The people gave up and never rebuilt Indianola. Today, it's a beautiful park. The cemetery, a reminder of how deadly wind and water can be. One of the most memorable hurricanes of modern times was Carla. She moved inland near Victoria in September of 1961. This time, the people of Galveston were prepared, and thousands of people left the island before the height of the storm. It has been called the greatest mass movement of its kind in peacetime history. The highways leading inland were clogged with traffic all night Friday, all day and all night Saturday the 10th. This is Hurricane Carla and all its strength after several days of waiting in the Gulf of Mexico. Late today it moved inland some 35 miles southeast of here and now in Victoria we're feeling the full force of Hurricane Carla said to be one of the worst ever to strike the Texas Gulf Coast. We don't know exactly how fast those winds are traveling behind me because about an hour ago, the anemometer that measures the velocity of the winds here for the weather station blew off with a part of the roof of the weather station here at Victoria. We don't know how fast they are just before the anemometer blew off the roof, leaving a large hole, incidentally. The velocity of the winds was about 100 miles per hour. It seems to be considerably worse now. The winds were 150 miles an hour at Fort Lavaca, 27 miles southeast of here, and the eye of the hurricane is reported there moving toward Victoria. Fort Lavaca reports it was in the eye of this large hurricane for one hour, calm for an hour at Fort Lavaca as the eye passed over. We have no reports of damage yet in Victoria, or for that matter in any of the low-lying coastal areas, but as we stand here, we've watched the radar tower come down at the, the Victoria airport, We've watched the roof come off of nearby buildings. We have no reports of what happened at Port Lavaca or Port O'Connor, where the storm came in to the Gulf Coast, but we can only assume that they had higher winds, that they had more damage than Victoria will have. The difference is that those low-lying areas had been evacuated by order before the hurricane hit this afternoon. Victoria was not. Some 35,000 people live here, plus 4,000 evacuees who came up from the low-lying coastal areas. All of those are behind boarded windows trying to weather the storm. This is Ken Fairchild, KPRC TV News, reporting from the Victoria weather station, Victoria, Texas. It was Monday afternoon that Ferris and Fairchild made this unusual sound film report on a hurricane in full cry. This is not a sound effect. This is the sound the sound camera actually picked up at Victoria at the height of the storm. The center of Carla remained in the Port Lavaca Victoria hour for several hours, finally moved slowly off northward toward Austin.
For three days, Carla rampaged through central Texas, from Victoria to Dallas. 34 people died. 465 were injured. She was the largest hurricane of record in Texas, even larger than the great Galveston storm of 1900. Winds gusted up to 175 miles an hour. Tides were up almost nine feet at Oso Bay. Many homes in Galveston were completely swept away. The dunes on Mustang Island were eroded by 15 feet. In all, 250,000 people were evacuated. He was raised in Baytown, the son of a refinery worker. His mother had a third grade education, but she taught him the value of learning, of laughter, of pride. When his father died, he left Bob a shaving mug, a Bible, and a legacy of hard work. From humble beginnings, Lanier joined the Navy, became a journalist, a lawyer, a banker, a builder with a vision. Now Bob Lanier is running for mayor because we need common sense or a change at City Hall. Carla spawned a record number of tornadoes, at least 26 and possibly many more. When it was over, Carla had done $40 million worth of damage. Thousands of people lost everything they had. This was the business section of Kima on Galveston Bay, hardly a stick left standing. Mrs. Georgia Dumas had a home and business here. Both disappeared. Did she know where she'd go, what she'd do? No but I'll make it. I'll make it was the theme of the comments heard from many of the coastal residents as they sifted through the ruins and sorted out the pieces. Some will leave the coast, some always do after a big storm. But most of the people who live on the coast know the risks and consider them not out of proportion to the advantages. Fairly typical the comment of Martin Hazard whose house on the bay was not quite destroyed by Carla. Not gonna worry me, I love this bay and I'm gonna stay with it. When Hurricane Beulah came along in September of 1967, she broke Carla's record for tornadoes, 155 of them, more than any other hurricane that we know of. 64 twisters struck in 24 hours, that's one every 20 minutes or so. And she drenched the state of Texas with rain, almost the entire area from Matagorda Bay, northwestward to San Antonio, and then southwest to Laredo received at least 10 inches of rain between the 19th and the 23rd of September. Many areas got over 20 inches of rain, and in a few places, 30 inches. Many weather stations recorded more rain in four days than they usually see all year long. This set off major flooding in every river and stream south of San Antonio. Beulah's winds got to 100 miles per hour at one time, but she weakened before she made landfall at Brownsville. Most of the heavy rains occurred while she was classified as a tropical depression. Now the good news about Beulah. She actually helped fishing by lowering the salinity levels in South Texas bays. Shrimp, oysters, and redfish flourished for years after that hurricane. Every hurricane is different, and even with all of our technology, they can often be unpredictable. When Celia hit Corpus Christi in August of 1970, she had short bursts of kinetic energy that caused more damage than many other storms with higher sustained winds. Some of the gusts got up to 181 miles an hour. Celia caused 11 deaths and 466 injuries. The property damage was over $500 million. A few minutes ago, we stood at a door inside the courthouse and watched houses, parts of houses, go rolling and flopping down the street. We watched one old Victorian-style two-story house, obviously a veteran of many hurricanes before, disintegrate and shower itself all over several blocks of downtown Rockport. Are gone, the water remains, flooding the roads and soaking what belongs. 
and are left in the shattered homes. The wind drives the rain and the salt spray with the impact like a shotgun. It scoops up the bay in big waves and throws it against and in into boats, flooding the houses too close to the beach. Some boats break loose and smash into the shore, and some are filled and sink. The water bats them all around and nibbles them away. And when the wind is gone, then the boats are in, are in pieces. The water is still there. This is Fred Edison. Celia's fury continued for hours. Almost everything in her path was damaged to some degree. Our field reporters stayed on the job throughout the storm. One team was on the eighth floor of a disintegrating building. And the other team was on the ground, exposed to the high winds and the falling debris. Their devotion to their jobs was exceptional. If they were worried, they didn't show it, except occasionally, the way soldiers sometimes do, by making bad jokes about their situation. Ordinarily, I don't eat Baby Ruth candy bars and hurricanes on company time, but this is an exception. He was raised in Baytown, the son of a refinery worker. When Hurricane Alicia hit in August of 1983, we were covering it around the clock. About 4 o'clock in the morning, we lost power, and our emergency generators had to kick in. But the power shift made our cameras sometimes look a little funny. And Dan O'Rourke, reporting from Galveston, had to use the telephone to get his report back to the station. We couldn't believe uh, that it could get any worse, but in the last 20 minutes, it has. Uh, it's raining and flowing harder than any of us around here have ever experienced. Uh, it's impossible to tell what kind of storm damage there is down here, but the fire trucks have been driving around uh, the streets all night. Uh, Here's an update on Hurricane Alicia at uh, 9 minutes before 4 o'clock on this Thursday morning. The hurricane uh, came ashore on the west end of Galveston Island just about an hour ago. Galveston being buffeted now by some sustained winds in excess of 100 miles an hour. Uh, let's go to Doug Johnson now, who is, has the only uh, radar operating in Houston television that's this, still operating. This is the last radar system visible in this part of the state of Texas right now. And we have at this time the eye still very nicely showing up on Channel 2 radar, right at the extreme west end of Galveston Island in the bay, and moving north-northwest to still about six or seven miles per hour. It still seems to be packing very high winds, and it's not likely to begin deteriorating for a while. But in this present movement, it's going to take it right through the southwestern corner of the city of Houston. High winds. It's been 21 years since Galveston has taken a hit from a hurricane. There have been glancing blows since Carla, but nothing like Alicia. The island was raked by 115 mile an hour winds and a whole spate of tornadoes. We still do not know how bad the damage is on West Beach. It is lined with those little houses on stilts. It is lined with trailers. This afternoon, it is littered with boards and pieces of sheetrock and tin. The mobile homes, the camper trailers are askew, ripped apart, jumbled. And this is not very deep down into West Beach. Authorities told reporter Christy Myers that 20% of the structures in Jamaica Beach, Sea Isle, Terramar, and Bay Harbor suffered major damage. But there has not been a complete search of the area because the road is still underwater or covered with debris. The good news is that nobody died on West Beach that we are aware of. So you're looking at the debris on West Beach. Let's go uptown along the seawall. Much the same story. That famed drive along the beach is a real obstacle course now. And the sights are frightening. Flagship hotel lost a part of the facade and the outer wall. Wind picked away at the hotel and chunks of it just flew away in the night. It was a night of terror for people in the Galvez. Windows popped, the power went out, and there were reports that one floor collapsed on another. The wind was so strong they had to tie a rope onto the door to keep it closed. Watch just a moment as panic sets in. About 50,000 people chose to stay on Galveston last night and ride out the storm. Suffice to say, it is a night that they will not soon forget. As soon as it got safe enough this afternoon, we decided to come up here in Sky 2 and see how our communities in the Houston-Galveston Bay Area fared through Hurricane Alicia. The arteries leading into the uh, Gulf Freeway 
You can see uh, where the road just all of a sudden ends here and cars are uh, in the water. And look at the Gulf Freeway. Now this is from uh, Bayou Vista, south of the causeway, about a mile and a half. You see all that debris, all that mud on the freeway? Well, this is plain evidence that part of the Gulf Freeway was covered by floodwaters sometime during the last 12 to 18 hours. This is the kind of thing that they were afraid of. It probably didn't make much difference. Nobody would have tried to evacuate Galveston Island uh, during the height of the storm, but this is proof positive that the Gulf Freeway does flood. It's gonna take a while to get these uh, lanes into Galveston cleared on I-45 as well. Now, if you own a beach house on West Beach, Galveston Island, better be glad you weren't in it last night. Looks like you've got a little work to do this weekend and for lots of weekends to come. Just about every beach house got some kind of damage. Some of these things look like they just exploded. Now, if the old worn out analogy about a war zone ever applied uh, during Hurricane Alicia, it certainly applies to West Beach here on Galveston Island. These beach houses are, in most cases, just destroyed, demolished. This kind of uh, destruction has not happened since Hurricane Carla. Alicia had sustained winds of 96 miles per hour, gusts to 127 miles per hour. At Seabrook, the tide rose 12 feet above normal. There were at least 22 tornadoes, and hundreds of trees were blown down. The trees could have filled a football field, piled 1,200 feet high. The tides ate up 150 feet of Galveston's West Beach. So some people not only lost their homes, they lost the land the homes were sitting on. For years, we fought to make buses accessible to people in wheelchairs. But the Metro Board kept telling us it wasn't cost effective. They didn't understand that this issue isn't about cost, it's about civil rights. Then Metro Chairman Bob Lanier took the time to listen, to learn, to understand our lives. Bob Lanier made history. He persuaded Metro to put lifts on all Houston buses. Thanks to Bob, there's more opportunity for everyone. During every hurricane, there are people who decide to stay put and weather the storm, even when they've been urged to evacuate. Well, sometimes they regret their decision. Sometimes they lose their lives. But sometimes they just get a good show. In August of 1989, some folks in Sabine Pass found Hurricane Chantal very entertaining. Some families never left. About a dozen of them stayed right on their front porches watch this whole thing kind of roar through. Out on the front porch and just watch the wind blow a little bit. That's uh, nothing to it. I just uh, enjoyed the, play, uh, the porch without the mosquitoes. That's about it. I mean, no problem. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Hurricane Jerry came late in the season. Remember now that hurricane season runs through the end of November, and it's pretty rare we have one in October or November. This one hit in October of 1989. There wasn't much rain with Jerry, but the winds got up to 115 miles an hour, and storm tides went to six feet in Galveston and to seven feet in Baytown. A Coast Guard seaman and his two-year-old daughter were killed when their car went over a seawall at the height of the storm. Even though Jerry wasn't a huge storm, there were three people killed, and there were a lot of injuries. People got hurt by flying glass and debris, and one man got a broken leg when he was struck by a falling tree. It's very important, therefore, to understand that any storm can be dangerous and to take all the precautions. Doug, whether you're new to town or have lived here all of your lives, the best time to be prepared is actually well in advance of a threatening hurricane or tropical storm. Now, being prepared means gathering the necessary items you'll need at home in the event of a storm, items like bottled water. But equally important to bottled water are necessary items like these, a battery-operated radio and batteries. Since the electricity is usually one of the first things that goes out at home, a battery-operated radio will keep you in tune with weather advisories and advisory from your local emergency management operators. Also, a first aid kit is very important in the event somebody gets hurt at home. Some people think it's safe to have candles around, but actually candles are often the cause for fires in the event of a storm, so it's important to have battery-operated flashlights. In the event of a really big hurricane, it is possible that electricity will be out for several days, so it's very important to stock up on non-perishable food items for the entire family. It's the little items that people tend to forget during a storm, items like can openers, hammers, and even rain gear. 
It's very important to keep an essential supply of batteries. You'll never know when you're going to need them, even for regular home use. Batteries have a, a long shelf life. This one will last you up to two years. You can use batteries for portable flashlights, portable radios, and even portable television sets. Hurricane Alicia's winds got up to 115 miles per hour. That kind of wind can cause some serious damage to your home. So it's a good idea to keep ample supply of plywood, things like plastic, and masking tape to protect your windows and doors. Falling power lines during a storm are usually responsible for numerous fires. So it's a good idea to keep one of these around. It's a fire extinguisher, relatively inexpensive, and could wind up saving a life. All in all, it shouldn't take a hurricane for you to have some of these items around the house. They're relatively inexpensive and have a long shelf life. But in case a storm does approach the Texas coast, at least you'll have the peace of mind knowing you're prepared for a storm. There are two terms that we'll be using occasionally that you need to keep in mind and understand. One is hurricane watch and the other is hurricane warning. A watch means that we need to make our plans, decide what we're going to do. We've got plenty of time to do it when the watch is issued, but a warning means that it is imminent. A watch means there's a high possibility. A warning means it is imminent, probably within 24 hours, sometimes even less. Most folks begin storm preparations around the house after a hurricane watch is posted, but before a hurricane warning is issued. And these preparations can begin with something as easy as just picking up around the yard. Patio and lawn furniture needs to be moved inside, out of the wind. Tying or lashing these items down simply won't do. And make sure you move everything inside, including the children's toys, any garden supplies, even firewood, anything that might be picked up and blown around. Well, you know, at this point, it might be a good idea to check in with your neighbors, especially if they're elderly, uh, just to see if they got the word about the coming storm. And even if they're not elderly, you might want to check in with them and see if they've gotten the word about picking up their lawn furniture. I see those lawn chairs over there. Hey, they could be headed for my window if the storm really does come this way. Don't forget the front and sides of the house. There are plenty of items lurking around, including potted plants. You know, some folks have lots of these. Even the heaviest ones should be moved or dragged inside. Also, garbage cans, no matter how many you have of them, whether they're rubber or metal. And those recycling bins so many of us are using now all need to go inside. The last thing you might consider doing if the arrival of a storm. In the western Pacific, they're called typhoons. In the Indian Ocean, cyclones. And the Australians call them willy willies. But in this part of the world, our name for the most destructive of all weather phenomenon is hurricane. Often, a hurricane that hits the Texas coast is born in Africa. It may start out as a rain shower or a small weather disturbance over the equatorial belt and then end up a swirling storm system covering thousands or even hundreds and thousands of square miles. We've been recording hurricanes and tropical storms since Columbus's second voyage to the New World. And you'd think in all that length of time we'd know everything there is to know about them. But they're still very, very mysterious. We do know in some ways they're connected with uh, disturbances out in the Sahara Desert over in Africa as they move out into the Atlantic. We know that a lot of disturbances move across the Atlantic. A few of them, and a very few, can become tropical depressions. That's when you have closed isobars or, or real circulation. Some of those, not very many, become tropical storms. They receive a name. That's when we are all alerted and become a bit more concerned about its course. And there's also a place out there called the envelope. And if one gets into that envelope, brings it into the Caribbean, then we know there's a fairly good chance that it could come into the Gulf of Mexico. Then we're really alerted by it. A few of those, and again, a very few, become hurricanes. And the hurricanes, of course, as we know, can be real killers. The deadliest natural disaster in the history of our country was the great Galveston hurricane of 1900. The winds registered 84 miles an hour, but that was just before the island's anemometer was blown away. We don't know how strong the winds eventually got. Tides 20 feet above normal swept over the entire island, damaging... For decorating fabric. Try the glitter. This is fun! Tulip Color Fast Paints. Available in leading craft, discount, and fabric stores. Look, Mommy, I'm a star. We all are. <laughs> There's nothing you can't do. Can you break her leg? Can you burn her house? The hottest story of the summer. 
To kill a child to help a child? Does that make sense? The cheerleader murder for hire trial. Television and tabloids reported on Wanda Holloway's every move. But Channel 2 News went one step further. An exclusive interview one-on-one -on -one with the woman many call the ultimate stage mother. Wherever it breaks, whatever it takes. Channel 2, Houston's 24-hour news channel. Watch us work for you. Ways to burglar-proof your home. Monday on Channel 2 News at 10. This program is brought to you by the Bob Lanier for Mayor campaign. I was born for this. It ain't natural. It's Erie, Indiana, premiering Sunday, September 15th on NBC. Mr. Chu will demonstrate the difference between reading the Houston Post and the other paper. Mr. Chu? As you can see, the other paper's a bit hard to get through. But the Post, now here's a complete paper. It's easy to read with all the news you need, fast. And now when you buy a new Sunday subscription, get the rest of the week free. Call 1-800-776-POST. Use your credit card, and when you buy Sundays, get Monday through Saturday free. The Houston Post. Call now. Presenting Tulip. Mommy, can we paint a bright running star? Well, sure, honey, it's easy. With Tulip at your there's nothing you can do. Tulip is the paint uniquely formulated. Everything in its wake. 2,600 homes were completely swept away, and the death toll was, of course, staggering. Thomas Edison recorded the aftermath with one of his new motion picture cameras. After all these years since the big 1900 hurricane, the worst ever, a lot of people think that uh, there was no knowledge to evacuate, that nobody even tried to. There have been the stories about the horses and the cattle heading to the north end of all the ranges to the fences. They knew something was coming. Also, about 12,000 people evacuated Galveston before that storm hit. But the rest of the population was stranded when a steamship broke free of its moorings and crashed through three bridges leading to the mainland.